Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? Jeff Mosher alongside Adam Kaplan. It is Sunday night uh, on the eve of June, May 31st. And Adam, I'll be the first to admit right now that um, Eagles football really is kind of one of the further things from my mind. But uh, we've got a job to do. We do this um, faithfully, and um, we do want to get into finishing our, our coaching staff preview. We did offense last uh podcast and we're going to go through the defensive staff this podcast and hopefully you and i can help some people put their put their minds to rest for the next 40 or so minutes and uh, the only thing i'd like to say is i hope everybody is safe and and healthy and dealing with the recent events the best they can my motto is be heard be safe and uh, i'll just leave it at that um Today, we are going to finish up our, our discussions about the coaching staff and going to the, the uh, defensive side. Adam, our last show, we took a deep dive into the offensive staff, and then we also went through some of the coaching staff's plans for Jalen Rager. I thought that was a pretty good podcast. We've gotten some nice reaction yeah. on that. Yeah. And also, the interview we did with Trey Thomas, people are still reacting to that. I, I really encourage people to check that out on, on YouTube, because what he did was break down Andre Dillard for us. And I think a lot of people have reached out to you. I've seen also in me about how, how well he kind of put it technically to relate it to the common person. Yeah. A couple things here. So the, the show that we broke down the offensive coaching staff, uh, we had so much stuff that we are getting from sources on that folks. So you're going to learn a lot of stuff you didn't know about the way the Eagles run the offense. Uh, Doug Peterson's strengths and weaknesses coming from several sources that we trust. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that you're not going to read anywhere else. We, 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 we don't deal with speculation. We deal with it with facts. Like th- what, do, what do people who work for the Eagles think? Mm-hmm. What do people think around the national football league think? And what, what the Eagles offense looked like not only last season, but since Peterson became the head coach and the play caller in 16, what kind of offense he, does he run? And then the new coaches, the big part about it and the comments that we got on our Facebook message board, we, we really encourage you to join there. I mean, we, we're getting between you know nine and ten thousand listeners per show, and we're just about to break a thousand Facebook users on our page. We'd like mm-hmm. to get that five six thousand people on there. So tell your friends, join our message board. If you listen to our show, and you want a question answered, go there because in the mailbag that you're going to see on on, on, on late uh, Monday afternoon Monday morning, you're going to notice that I took some co- some questions from our message board on Facebook. So that's probably the best place for you to get your question answered. All right. Now you've recently done an, also an inside the birds Q and a, correct? Or any, yeah, that's uh, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, right. yeah, exactly. I actually, as, as we dropped, as we were putting the show up on Monday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern, which we, by the way, every Monday, every Thursday, 6 a.m. Eastern, that's when you get our shows. And then uh, eventually we, we put it on YouTube, but Jeff, that YouTube page, I'll tell you what, man, we've got a lot of stuff up there and people are starting to hit that a little bit. Yeah, it's been fun to do. We did, uh, I think two weeks ago, we did a fantasy football Eagles preview, just focusing on Carson Wentz and Miles Sanders. We're going to do part two of that coming up this week, and we'll focus on the wide receivers, which would be really interesting. And of course, the tight ends, uh, yep. the, the strength of the offense. So make sure this week you're subscribing to our YouTube page and you'll get the notifications when that gets dropped. So look forward to that. And again, InsideTheBirds.com. Uh, check out our off-season review series that Andrew DeCecco and I have done and uh, Adam's mailbag. All right, let's get into the defensive coaching staff, yeah, let's Adam. Do it. Uh, yep. let's do it. Because I like what we're, we're going to go here. We're, we're, last podcast, we did kind of offense and what we might see changes because of the new personnel. This week, we're going to talk about the defensive staff, and there are new people uh, involved we'll get into them but there also could be some adjustments going on in what we've seen from the Eagles defensively uh, what we're going to see compared to what we've seen the last few years and of course that starts all with defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz this is going to be his fifth year god it feels like he's been here for 20 I, years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the criticism he gets well, uh, well, game after it, game <laughs> yeah you know it's interesting I I, I wasn't <laughs> in 2016 you know, they, they look, the Eagles were seven and 19, but Schwartz was the one where you go, okay, he's got a side of the ball get going on here. And then 2017, it was the opposite. The offense took a major jump. The defense was inconsistent. You saw some good things, especially with the front four, mm-hmm. but the one constant, it clearly has been their offense. Offense is clearly outshine their defense, but 
There's some reasons for that, which we're going to get into. You know, Schwartz, listen, Jeff, Jim Schwartz is a solid football coach. Uh, I, I always use that 10 point scale. He's somewhere, but for me, seven, seven and a half out of 10. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. can win with him, but there's a reason why he's not a nine. And we're going to get into that. Uh, and th- they've had some changes, by the way. Uh, all, on the front, they've got a new D line coach, the fourth and six years. And then they've got also got a new DBs coach. Uh, Corey Unlin moved on. Uh, he he mm-hmm. had been uh, their coach for five years, and we'll get to him. But you know, let's get with Jim Schwartz, Jeff. Yeah. Strength and weaknesses. Give give me what you got on him, and then I'll give you what I have. Well, I, you know, when I talk to people around the league and with the team, the one thing that they do believe in Jim, and I and I talk to people who like Jim, but also think he's flawed or don't like some of the things he does, but will recognize he does things well. Um, very smart. I think the first thing that you, you get when you talk to people about Jim is that they will tell you, no doubt about it, he is a, a very, very smart uh, defensive mind. And what he what that enables him to do, Adam, is I think he's also – he's not relatable the same way Doug is. Doug kind of has that every man, I'll put my arm around you. But I know Jim is tenacious, and his players really respond to how tenacious – he is. Uh, we've seen that on the sideline, right? Where he's just, he gets into it and the, and, the, and the defensive linemen usually are standing next to him and they're kind of fired up by him. But I will give Jim a lot of credit for this. Uh, I think that it's, you can fairly say he has probably done in the most with the least amount of talent, especially when you consider linebacker and secondary. The fact that he has, especially over the last two years, been able to – this team has made the playoffs and he's had some really good defensive games, especially at home – when he really doesn't have – he's not had blue-chip talent other than Malcolm Jenkins in the secondary and then none at linebacker, really blue-chip talent. There's some impressiveness in there. He gets his guys to play for him. Yeah, look, over the years he's had Jordan Hicks. Uh, Hicks was a, a draft pick of Chip Kelly, but Jordan Hicks before he left certainly flashed a little bit. Um, you're right, linebacker's been a disaster more or less since he's come in here. It's not his fault. It's the – and we'll get into sort of – sort of that position in a couple of minutes here. But so I always like to break it when, when I evaluate coaches based on Intel that I get from people work with them and, and how they're viewed. I, I looked at strengths and weaknesses. You pointed out the strengths that he has. Uh, he has a plan. Now he's a little bit stubborn. I know this bothers some people, Definitely. but um, he runs his wide nine 43 front. They're not multiple. They're not, you're not going to see him. They're not going to run what's called a bare front when they have an add in defender, with his hand down, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a four man front. Uh, They don't blitz very much. This bothers people, but remember the father of the wide nine, Jim Washburn, he hated blitzing. I mean, you literally would have to torture him to blitz. That's Schwartz is the same way. He doesn't believe in it. He does it when he has to. Um, the, 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 The thing about Schwartz that I like is he knows who he is. He knows what he wants. And he coaches hard, and the guys respond. That that is another thing. And it's the same way with with Doug Peterson. The, the players do respond to Jim's coaching. That I cannot tell you how important that is, because if you if you don't get guys to respond, you're probably not going to keep your job for very long. And Jim obviously has, has been in the league a long time. Former head coach of the Lions, longtime coordinator, done a good job. Working league office for a year, no, no, knows what he wants, knows knows how to get it. The weaknesses, a little bit more complex and detailed, but I'm going to give them to you based on three people I spoke to who know Schwartz's scheme better than anyone uh, who doesn't, you know, he's not coaching with Jim. Let's put it that way. Um, the big issue is the lack of pre and post snap disguise on the back end. They yes. just don't do it very much. Uh, a veteran quarterback can tear this, this team apart. Did you see what Ryan Fitzpatrick did embarrass them last year in Miami? That is the quintessential problem with the wide nine. Two years, by the way, that he's yes, done that now. Yes, yes, he did. But Tampa the, big, the year before. Yeah, Tampa, he just he, he just destroyed them in the heat. Was it week two at Tampa? Yeah, week two. I mean, he yeah. was, that was actually a better game than his Miami game. He had 400 and something yards that game. But this one was awful. This Miami yeah. game was awful. There's no way in hell they should have had a game like that. That I would have to say, uh, you and I would have to kind of look at the games where they blew leads. Mm-hmm. In his tenure here, that was probably, other than the Super Bowl, ironically, uh, one of the hardest games for people to, to watch tape of the mental errors, the lack of discipline on the back end. That was a awful, that was just an awful game. That game. I could tell you talking to people with Eagles that bothered the hell out of them. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I can't sugarcoat it. 
the, the, the one valid criticism from tape study is a lack of pre-snap to skies and, and post-snap on the back end. Now, the argument is, well, what is he working with? There's, there's, there's obviously truth of it. And we're going to get into the, the, the defensive back coaching and uh, Corey Unlin and, and, and the struggles that they had under him. Mm-hmm. But that's something that you're hoping now will change with Marquand Manuel coming in, who's a former de- defensive coordinator, albeit for one year, a former safety. You might remember him from the Packers. Uh, and, and Seahawks, good football player, and got a raw D on Atlanta. He's getting a second chance now to be a DB's coach. So the hope is that Schwartz has better coaching here. Uh, and by the way, when you get you look at the D-line coach with Matt Burr coming in, a guy that he knows, he who coached for him in Detroit, who's also been a coordinator, the hope is with better coaching, Jim will be able to do more because they're very vanilla. They don't do anything that's exotic. Uh, yeah, they they have some movement on their front. Well, so does every other team. That's nothing new. That, if you know anything about the way that Schwartz coaches, it's a very simple scheme. Veteran quarterbacks, especially on the road, Jeff, they t- typically do well against Schwartz. The thing that 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 you don't understand is why the issues with home and road sl- splits. Last season was one of the best examples of it. They were so good at home defensively. They they frustrated the hell out of Brady. They did a yeoman's job against Seattle. No question about it. Mm-hmm. But why, Jeff, the problems on the road, I cannot understand it. No, and that's one of the things that when you try to ask around, and I'm sure you've been met with the same kind of response, that one is tougher for people to decipher. It, some of, Could it be coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But there's nothing where I, somebody can has pointed their finger at saying, this is what the Eagles don't do well on the road compared to home. And and the reason why you can't point the finger and you just said it is because Jim doesn't switch things up on a home to road or game to game basis. His defense is what it is. Now we'd have to go back and look, maybe the caliber of quarterback they've happened to face on the road for last year or two happens to be better than it was in the first two years in beer. I I don't know what it is. Well, well, it's funny you say that because Jeff, if you look at the numbers, when Jim faces young quarterbacks, particularly rookies, Mm-hmm. More often than not, they do pretty well, whether it's home or away, but better right. at home. But look, inexperienced quarterbacks, poor Luke Falk. Remember that 10-sack game against the Jets? That was – it was crazy. And I give Schwartz credit. He saw blood and he went after it. They blitzed like mm-hmm. crazy. Like they've never blitzed. I think they blitzed like over 50% of the time, which is ridiculous. Like nobody does that. But he did a great job that game. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Jim, the hope is with better personnel, having a true number one corner. Darius Slay, who should travel, by the way, that uh, just talking to some people are familiar with Jim's scheme. He, he's because Jim does not travel his corners. Maybe now he does it. And, and I think part of the problems that Schwartz has had when they haven't done well is he's been victim to the talent that he's been given. Other than the yeah. front where they have a, they're loaded with talent. And it's safety, obviously, corner and linebacker, as you outlined earlier, Jeff, where are the stars in here? Where have the stars been? They haven't had any. No, I think you you hit on a good point is that you hope that with you hope as you mentioned that with the new coaches that it's an upgrade in coaching and you also expect that not just with the addition of Darius Slay but also of Javon Hargrave and people forget you're getting you hope knock on wood Malik Jackson for longer than just one game that's <laughs> one two that's three impact players on the defense yeah. and of course you lost Malcolm Jenkins but it, they it's brought in, one. yeah, they, they brought in Will Parks and they're moving yeah. Mills in there and they drafted Kevon Wallace and we'll have to hope and see that. Uh, I don't think any of them can single handedly replace Malcolm, but I think they can play their roles and try to each duplicate what Malcolm did within their own system. I want to add this with Malcolm Jenkins, other than Brian Dawkins, you may not find a smarter safety than, than Malcolm Jenkins who's played here. Rodney mm-hmm. McLeod is up there and he's still here. He is 30 now. But I don't know that you're going to – he's, as you just said, I just want to add this. He's kind of, He was kind of like the assistant coach on the field, Malcolm Jenkins. You don't find anyone like him. No, it's I'm not going to ver- replace. Right, yeah. and now Rodney will have to take more of a leadership role in terms of lining guys up. But the, the one thing that people struggle with, and this has been constant since 16, when you don't disguise on the back end, back end against a veteran quarterback – you can't feel good about it, whether game's home or away. It doesn't even matter. You could play it on Mars. It doesn't matter. If you don't if you don't scheme against on the back end better, you're going to put so much pressure on your offensive score because they're not – when they have to stop somebody on the road, they're probably not going to be able to do it. 
No, you're right. Um, they, they need to stay healthy too, because as we've mentioned in the past, you know, your one Darius Slay injury from having a very, very mediocre or not very good uh, <laughs> cornerback, and one injury. If Rodney McLeod were to get hurt, and he's over thirty oh, now, yeah, yeah. you're really, really young and raw at safety as well. And by the way, Daniel Jones tore them up. If you remember in Philly, was it the Monday night game where Darius Slay destroyed was... Darius Slayton destroyed them? Yes. Was it the game yeah. here where he just ran right by all those guys? So yeah. you can't say it's all on the road. Um, and, and by the way, Daniel Jones was a rookie quarterback. Yeah, they mm-hmm. found a way to win that game. I don't know how, but uh, they, they right. fought against the Giants. But look, the bottom line is they've gotten better. They've got more talent at D tackle. No one's deeper D tackle. And let's let's Jeff, let's get over to the coaching. Uh, mm-hmm. Now that we've talked about Schwartz. And we, Wait, we Adam, real quick. Can I make one? Can I just sure, I want to I wonder do. one thing about Schwartz. Yeah, I wonder if because, again, we have not seen him have a player of Darius Slay's capability in the the secondary. I do wonder if that addition of that and the two linemen coming back, if we see a little bit more creativity that you're mentioning, whether it's movement or just a little bit more blitzing, I don't expect him to turn into Todd Bowles overnight. Todd Bowles is one of the Uh most notorious blitzers. Um, I just wonder if with personnel, better personnel and coaching, if he'll be a little bit more daring when the time comes to be yeah, there. that's what I was saying. Yeah, I, yeah. I the, uh, uh, well, not blitzing, but dis- from disguise wise, mm-hmm. you now have and by, Nick Coleman. You you've got McLeod coming back. You've got Jalen Mills now. He's he's going to be a hybrid player. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have better talent. Will Parks, who you mentioned, Cravon LeBlanc is now healthy, coming back from his list Franck injury. You mentioned Kayvon Wallace. They've got youth. They've got ability, but they don't have Malcolm and. Right. Um, the, 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 the one thing I do want to add before we get to Matt Burke here is the amount of men, the amount of mental errors from Ronald Darby, uh, and, and, uh, some of the other guys, Sidney Jones and Rasul yeah. Douglas, Yeah, the, this drives coaches crazy. Now, mm-hmm. you, whether you want to blame Corey Unlin, you want to blame Schwartz or whoever, uh, the Eagles pride themselves on, on drafting and signing smart players, but for whatever happens, the, the. The, the secondary has been an absolute disaster since 16. Really, this, since this group of coaches have come in, when have they ever put together a good good secondary? Well, I'll answer that for you. They haven't. It hasn't yeah. happened. I mean, they're be- they're, obviously yeah, on the outside, a corner, a corner. Right. Their best corner when they won the Super Bowl was the slot corner, Patrick Robinson. And that was kind of a amazing year, and, and then it was gone, you know, right after the year. So, um, yeah. yeah, we'll have to see what he does with the new upgrades. All right, Matt Burke. The whole defensive line coaching situation, I think, is a little bit fascinating. Matt <laughs> yeah. Burke, uh, he's been a defensive coordinator with the Dolphins. He has been with Jim Schwartz before, I think, in Tennessee and Detroit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he definitely was Detroit. He was a linebacker's coach I th- there. I, I thought he was also with Jim in Tennessee. I'd have to check that out real quick. But I, I yeah, that I don't know yeah. about. But he, he but knows he's never coached D line, right? That, I know. This is yeah, his, this- yeah. This is the strange thing. So, so, um. Here's here's a one person game. I thought this was great stuff. The biggest issue that that they've had, and by the way, this is Matt Burke. He's their fourth D line coach in six years. The biggest issue that people of Great Eagles Tape have told me mm-hmm. that there's been a real lack of strategy with their D line, uh, matchup wise. Um, yeah, did they play games up front? Sure, but matchup wise, they've not always taken advantage of matchups, and it drives people crazy. Because you look at the talent level that they've had in their D line, mm-hmm. why aren't they more successful? Like, yeah, it's it's a good D line. It should be a great D line, and they haven't had a great D line. Um, for so so Matt Burke, who's smart and he knows the the the, the wide nine because he's that's all he's done is coach this. Right. Uh, as a D quarter in Miami, they were one of the few teams to use it. So they're going to continue. They're going to continue to use it, and Bur- Burke will, will will be in there. Nate Ollie was retained as assistant right. D line coach, and now. Uh, from what I've heard, Jeremiah Washburn should be because he's a senior defensive assistant. If he's going to be in any room, I'm told it'll be in the defensive line room. So I don't know how much he'll be there because he's also director of player personnel. <laughs> this is so, the part that I find yeah. fascinating because he's yeah. probably of all three names. Ha- he definitely has the most experience coaching D line. And yet by title alone, you would think he had, he would Has have he, when, he was an offensive line coach. When did he I'm sorry? No, he, I'm sorry. He was an offensive line coach. Yeah. I guess I'm just associating him with his dad. Right. Being yeah. Isn't it crazy? I know. Right. Yeah. Right. Although I'll tell you what though, <laughs> the, the, this brings up a good point. 
what Jeremiah coach offensive line. He should know uh, what he's going up against on uh, defensive sure. line wise protections, so that, everything like that. Yes. Yeah. That I'm so glad you mentioned that because that was the way it was explained to me. He's going to have a, a different voice. They've never had in there. This is like the million dollar defensive line. They spent so much money on their D line, particularly D tackle. Right. This should be the NFL's best D line. You don't have to be great on the outside when you're great yeah. on the inside. Yeah. You could be good on the outside and great on the inside. So, uh, so, so Burke, from a strategy standpoint, mm-hmm. should be great. Jeremiah Washburn should help. And Nate Ollie was, you know, he's been there f- for a little bit as a, the assistant. These three guys should get this thing going. This, if this line isn't dominant and everybody's healthy, somebody's going to lose their job because oh, there's yeah. too much money here invested. I agree. And by the way, Matt Burke did uh, coach in Tennessee. Okay, uh, cool. From 2004 did, to 2008, before he went with Schwartz to, de- does it say, to was Detroit. He, okay, was he linebackers coach? He was, and I'll tell you right now, I had it. He, in Tennessee, he was an administrative assistant from okay. 2004 to 2005. And then he was the defense quality control coach from 2006 to 2008. And then okay. Schwartz got the job in Detroit, hired him, Matt Burke, to be the linebackers coach, which he did from... 2009 to 2013 and he's a former d coordinator albeit for one year uh, yeah this, one year this, for the dolphins yes the one issue that you have because you as you said burke has never coached the, he's never coached the d-line there's a big thing on technique I, I remember uh mike zimmer telling me many years ago he said d linemen do not get on the field unless they master our technique mm-hmm. matt what would matt burke know about technique when he's never coached the d-line no, I think that's a great question. I so, really, you know, it almost uh, seems like the veterans have to be uh, coaching the kids a little bit here. I, I don't care I, I how don't smart know. you are. If you you got to know, re- yes, just as you just said, <laughs> if if you haven't coached it before, you got to first find out how they've been coached because you know that from Matt's been around the team. You know, he's with the team last year. And is this the second year or third year with them? I can't remember, but uh, he's been with the team before, so he kind of knows. Yeah, this is uh, year two with, of uh, of Matt Burke. Right, and he was a, he was a senior defensive assistant, you know, mm-hmm. um, last year. Right, so he he knows the way that they were coached. He was in the room. I'm sure he was in the room. He watched the tape, but I'm hoping Nate Ali obviously will tell him how Philip Daniels taught it, and Chris Wilson as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- they'll have their intel, uh, and they're going to have to know. And that that that's the thing that you struggle with is the way you hand usage, how you yeah. punching, how you scooping. Right. However, whatever the techniques are, that's something that Matt's going to have to get. And, and, and he's a smart guy. I know that coaches talk to coaches around the National Football League. Uh, but the good thing is because it's the wide nine, he knows the scheme. He probably has a good idea the way the, the way that needs to be done. But just keep an eye on that, folks. For those of us who watch all 22, just remember this in season, especially early on. Look at look at seeing look at seeing how Burke is coaching them, because if this D line doesn't dominate, man, so it, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, you know, the more I think of it, Adam, you might consider uh, Nate Ali the most important assistant coach on the team uh, because he is the assistant D line coach, and he's actually coached the D line before. And as you mentioned, he may be really relied upon to be teaching technique more so than even the actual position coach and Matt Burke. Uh, I, I think if there was one question, I would ha- I would ask Jim. Schwartz next time uh, there's a press conference or teleconference or whatever, if I'm able to be on it, I would say this, I would ask him, what is he looking for in a defensive line coach? Because as you mentioned, this will be their what fifth or fourth one in the last six Six years. years. Yep. And it's not like the D line has been weak. It may not be as what everybody wants it to be, but 2017, it was pretty good. Um, 2018, it was pretty good. It's been pretty good. It's always among the top in pass rush percentage. They, maybe the, not sacks. The tape, though, man, they do. Yeah. They did very little strategy wise. They did not take yeah, care of matchups, that. and that yeah. it's. This is all. Almost all of my information is based on tape study. You can't challenge tape study. It, it is what it is. You could. Mm-hmm. You could. You could give me numbers, but the tape is can't be challenged. It, it, it tells you everything you need to know. Right. And this D line should even be better. And you want. It, it was kind of like what happened last year before, well, before Deshaun was hurt early and then uh, and th- then Jeffrey got hurt. But last year, the criticism on offense was they didn't take care, they didn't take advantage of matchups. And you saw what happened with the coaches, whether it's fair or not, that was the blame there. 
-hmm. And there's a lot of money that they've invested uh, on this D-line, and they better dominate, and they should dominate every week. Um, you know, Matt, Matt Burke's a smart guy, but being smart doesn't make you great at your job. That's you gotta true. be able to, you gotta be able to coach. All right, let's get into linebacking coach, uh, secondary coach. We'll get into that first, Adam. I got breaking news. Ah. DraftKings Sportsbook, yes, that DraftKings is now offering a mobile casino in Pennsylvania. DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino offers an endless amount of casino games to play, all from the comfort and safety of your home. And right now, all first-time casino players can play up to $200 risk-free for the first 24 hours of casino play. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and find the casino games app in the uh, or the casino games in the top navigation bar to start playing. Options, you want options. Choose from slots, blackjacks, roulette, table games, live dealers, and more. DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino is a legal, safe, and secure than secure gaming app. You can with with deposit, withdraw your money at your convenience. Plus, DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino is offering special promotions every day, so be sure to check the app daily. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino app now and use the promo code ITB to play risk-free up to $200 at casino games for your first 24 hours. That's promo code ITB to play risk-free up to $200 for your first 24 hours of casino play on DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only in partnership with Hollywood Casino and Penn National Racecourse. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem call one 800 gambler all right let us talk about the linebackers coach because um there's been a lot of change at linebacker adam um with names but still the same guy uh ken flagell is the linebackers coach here's what i, I find is interesting ken's been a defensive coordinator before matt burke's been a defensive coordinator uh marquan manuel who's now the secondaries coach has been a def defensive coordinator so you have a former d coordinator at every single position coach mm -hmm. position it's pretty yeah good. Yeah, it is. Look, it, it, Ken is a disciplinarian. He likes guys who could execute mentally. The reason why Nate Gary is one of his favorite players, sort of like teacher's pet, as one team source said to me, and I kind of laughed at that one, because <laughs> he executes what he's told to do. You, We could talk all we want. He's not very good or he's not good enough. I mm -hmm. use a line that coaches use all the time. He's the kind of guy that we're always looking to replace but can't. Uh, reasons are maybe you don't, they're not the guys you have in your roster aren't good enough to beat them out, uh, right. which is not, a, <laughs> it's not good. But uh, the fact of the matter is, look, it's been a good fifth round pick, whether you, you, you like it or not. Uh, he was part of the Super Bowl team, didn't play very much, but uh, he's been starting for a while. Uh, I would say this on Flagel you definitely could criticize him and say, okay, who have you really developed? Uh, the successes, Jordan Hicks was drafted a year before he got there, Jordan Hicks did well. When he was mm -hmm. healthy under Flagel, Camus Grugier Hill definitely was a good story. He, he definitely developed. Yeah. There's no question. That was a great mm -hmm. waiver claim by the Eagles coming from the Patriots. And Najee, good. I, I put him on the list only because he was there forever. He, I think he was there for five years mm -hmm. uh, on and off the roster. He was, he was a good backup for them. But the, the thing is, Jeff, they only have drafted four linebackers in five years. By the way, two of them came in this year's draft. They just have not addressed the position very much. No, and we, you know, we talk about emphasis and de-emphasis on certain positions. Um, I don't even know how to judge Ken because, again, they haven't given him great talent. I, I feel like he's kind of the hidden guy on the coaching staff, not not talked about a lot. Certainly not as much pressure. I mean, we, on I'm our sure, show he has been. <laughs> he sure oh, on ours, been. yeah, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, we were pretty strong fans, last year. Yeah. If you ask fans who they, you know, have a have a, a gripe with most uh, outside of Jim Schwartz, it's usually Corey Unlin because yeah. the cornerbacks yeah. have not played well. It's usually the defensive line's not getting enough. So uh, you don't hear a lot about Ken. Do you know how many teams he's worked for, Adam? How many NFL teams? I know Carolina D coordinator, Cleveland. Uh, he was not. He was. He was. He was linebackers coach of Carolina. He was D coordinator with St. Louis. Okay, Rams under Spags. Yes, that's probably how Peterson knows him, but. I don't yes. know how many teams. Please six. Wow. He's worked he with had Green Bay, Seattle, yeah. Yeah. Carolina, wow. St. Louis, New Orleans. Oh wait, Cleveland, uh, Philly. So that's seven. Seven different. New NFL Orleans. Teams. God, I don't remember that. Wow. Yeah, wow. I think okay. he went with Spags there, didn't? Because right, Spags was the head coach of the Rams. He was a D coordinator. Yeah, Spags was the D coordinator for the Saints. For it was not good for Spags there. They were brutal. Um, right. Where did Spags yeah. become the head coach? Uh, Rams. Right, and that's where Felizzo was the defensive coordinator. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Flavor. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, so, okay. Guys who've not developed I, mm-hmm. the LJ Fort debacle. That was on flagel. There's no, here's what I know. Okay. <laughs> LJ Fort was either the best linebacker or second best linebacker in training camp for the life of me. And by the way, he had, I'm told he had Fort in uh, Cleveland. Mm-hmm. So he knew the player. Yeah. The bottom line is he, Fort never should be cut out. I, I know he went up. It's just crazy what happened. He signs, he goes to Baltimore, signs his extent, did so well, signed an extension in season. Like, <laughs> how the hell does that happen? But it never should have uh, been cut. That was a major mistake. Uh, okay, major. That's a little strong. That was a mistake. <laughs> that was a bad mistake. Right. He would have started. I know he's older, but uh, high character kid, just a dumb mistake. They should never cut him. Uh, Corey Nelson did make it. They, they didn't pay him a lot of money, Jeff. Very little money. Did they owe him after they cut him? He right. didn't even make it. I don't think, did he make it to training camp? He may, I believe he was among the, you know how there used to be two rounds of cuts. They would have that first round of cuts where you only had to go down to like 75 on the roster. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you would cut like seven or eight people. He was in, I'm pretty sure he was involved in that part of the cuts. It was surprising that like, he wasn't one of those guys who didn't make it onto the 53 because he was cut the day before he was literally among the first round of cuts. Right. So, so yeah, he didn't, they brought him in and probably play weak side linebacker never made it. And then Zach right. Brown, I don't blame him. I don't blame, blame Flagel for this one. Uh, Cause Zach Brown was a knucklehead. I mean, he should have, he, he, he opened his mouth, he ran his mouth and uh, within 24 hours after doing that, they cut him and he mm-hmm. never became playing. He came in very heavy. Uh, he, he, Which he was an issue way, with him in the past, if I'm not mistaken, right? And by the way, well, it's the funny, I should say very heavy. He came a little bit heavier than they like. And the funny thing is about Zach Brown, when he came in the league, it was about 229, 230. Uh, he, coming out of Carolina, he was a little bit, uh, he was a little bit, he, he was too undersized. Uh, mm-hmm. re, it's a shame. It just didn't work. And uh, by the way, he never signed with another, he didn't sign with another team after that. No, it's, uh, it's kind wow. of interesting. And neither wow. did Orlando Skandrick, by the way, correct? uh skandrick i don't believe so we did show up on television though yeah so i mean it just kind of it's just last year was just a bad year for howie's kind of veteran street free agent signings it didn't cost them not only were they not great players no it wasn't about not costing money it's just that they but they needed everybody people were excited because they felt like they were good value signings a veteran on a low deal it reminded them a little bit i think of like garrett blunt and chris long but it did not turn out to be anything like like garrett blunt or chris long or patrick robinson uh, uh, right and by the way t- 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 tackles are i don't say that they're a nonsense stat it doesn't really mean much you got to watch the tape zach brown's history was a- of lack of discipline as a tackler he was a flash player but you wouldn't hear about anything about him missing tackles because if you didn't watch the tape you wouldn't know about it can right. I tell you how many teams told me, oh, there's no way we're signing him. He could put up 300 tackles. It doesn't matter. He's not good enough. This mm-hmm. is too many tackles. He overruns plays. Ernie Sims. Remember Ernie Sims? Shark <laughs> in the water. Oh, one, yeah. of, one of the questions I regret asking Sean McDermott, that was my question to him. That was you? Yeah, it was me. It was, yeah, that's when you I used to You regret that question? Yeah, I just, just I, I, I know Sean. I don't. That. I felt <laughs> bad. I just great felt, quote. <laughs> I, fe- I felt bad because I knew... I could ne- I knew about Ernie Sims before he, he was with Detroit. He was a former first round pick, really, really light. He was like 220, 225. Unbelievably fast, but so undisciplined as a tackler. Oh, and, and I remember yeah. I remember cautioning people, Adam. I, I remember not, not as much as I did with say Doriel Green Beckham, but I remember saying <laughs> to people at the time, because this is years before DGB, that when a guy who was a what was he, the ninth overall pick in the draft? Wasn't he? He was a high pick, was he not? Ernie Sim? Sims. Uh, very yeah, he was, he was top fifteen yeah. to, to the Lions. Yeah, right. When a guy is just given away for a fifth round pick, it's time to stop looking at him like he was a number one or top twenty. Doesn't you, matter. Got to, yeah, it doesn't. If he's doesn't up for matter. sale for that, he's probably not what he was supposed to be. Pro tip for folks out there: once they play a, a year in the National Football League, I don't care if they're the first pick or overall. It's completely irrelevant to. It doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, the, you Absolutely. only evaluate going forward once the National Football League. Yes, they have traits from college, but it doesn't matter. You go by the tape and you and then you know you you evaluate and 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 sort of recalibrate your evaluation of that player. Uh, so I, I don't blame him. F- uh, we're talking about Clint, Ken Flagel here, the linebacker coach. By the way, Ryan Pagnetti's his assistant, who's, who's mm-hmm. also handles game, uh, he has a role in game management, but right. The bottom line is here, they have not really helped him with talent. 
and I get it. This this is something Joe Banner did uh, when he was the Eagles president. They made a decision they were not going to pay linebackers, more or less. Uh, they were going to invest their money, and they're right about this. You always invest in the offensive and defensive lines, uh, corner, and you you really – you could pay one linebacker. You can't pay, pay two. Like the Raiders, they made a mistake. They're they paying two linebackers really high-end money. That was a mistake. They shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't tie your cash and cap dollars at linebacker. You just don't, unless they're superstars. Like right. uh, Luke, Luke Kuechly, okay, you pay him because he's, he's going to be a right. Hall of Famer. But. Or, or you, if you run a certain scheme like the Steelers do where you accentuate your linebackers and, and they draft linebackers well, very high. Well, outside, yeah, but you don't pay two inside linebackers. You got to be careful with that. You could pay one well, outside and one side. I know, but don't you think that, I mean, they, they traded up to get, um, what's his name? Devin White, right? No, that Devin, De- Devin, no, uh, Devin White's with Devin Bush, Bush, Bush. Devin yeah, Bush. Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, obviously, they they well, I forget where Shay's year got drafted. I think it was a first round pick. I just know the Steelers put a lot of draft capital. Well, they try and, to replace uh, him, uh, Shay's year. Yeah, they try to, right? Replace but they'll him. put money into inside line, maybe not two, but they'll spend for at least one and then put a decent guy next to him. But that's how they run their they two, I believe they two gap and they do they of oh, traditionally relied on their their inside linebackers to make plays everywhere. But with the Eagles, you, you're just – it'll never change. I right, don't blame the them. totally different. But yeah. what I'd like to see, and I, this is a big thing I, I'd said, uh, you're going to free agency and the draft, it wouldn't be nice if they actually developed a – it didn't have to be a pro bowler. Mm-hmm. But a guy that you when you're watching the game on television, you go, wow, that's a football player. Hmm. I'm trying to think of a good – Example like somebody the Eagles have had. I mean, Jordan Hicks is was a pro. Oh, he was not now. Nah, nah, yeah, he made. Yeah. Oh, with the interceptions and the t- the forced uh, the forced yeah, fumble. Playmaker. And he had I'm one. Yes, that's it. Playmaker. I've used that term a lot here. I wish they get one. He was the only one yeah. they've had. You know, Nigel six. Bradham is a good example. If they could draft a player who could be play in the league for six or seven years and 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 be steady like Nigel and yeah, hit, he's going to be flawed but he's going to do well at certain times right the, the, yeah. the, the 17 year he he played well uh, but the bottom line is they just have not developed much at linebacker uh, mm-hmm. uh now he, they 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 have a challenge now with Davion Taylor Sean Bradley very, very iffy to make the team he'll never start he'll be a special teams player mm-hmm. maybe play in sub but Davion Taylor they're expecting to eventually start. I couldn't tell if it's going to be – it won't be this year. I don't know if it'll be year two or three. Take a miracle. Yeah. He needs to put weight on. We know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, needs to learn how to play defense, like in a real pro system as well. Yeah, and he's – look, remember, he didn't play football very much last – you know. Right. Because of his uh, – he started his career a little bit later because of uh, his, his uh, beliefs. But bottom line is they need to get more out of the linebacker position. All right, let's move on to defensive back. Talk about Marquand Manuel. It's his first year with the team. He's a recent hire. As you mentioned, uh, he was a defensive coordinator with Atlanta. Got fired, was it midway through last year, Adam, or at the end of the year? I don't know. No, no, no. Or, he, or was it he, the two, it years, two years ago? ago two fired. years ago. Yeah. He right. Here's what happened. Dan Quinn fired. He made everyone scapegoats. He fired the special teams coach, the DB's coach. He fired, I think. Uh he both oh, he fired both coordinators. He, uh Manuel and um, the guy went to Alabama, Steve Sarkeesian, Sark. Right. Sark. Offensive coordinator, right. Right, right. And last season, remember, they were getting destroyed. And then what DQ did, Dan Quinn did, he gave uh, Jeff Ulbrich and Raheem Morris the responsibilities to run the defense. Co-coordinators. They did a really nice job, and now Raheem's going to run it. Mm -hmm. But Mark Quan's a former player, smart guy. He's going to get his chance here to revive his career. Uh, good for the Eagles. They um, they were I, and this story here. I know that he was recommended by somebody to, for the Eagles to take a look at him. He interviewed mm-hmm. very well, I'm told, and they hired him. Mm-hmm. Um, look, the bottom line is Corey Allen did not do a very good job here in Philly. Gr- good guy, uh, very well well liked it, you know, by everybody he worked with. But if you look, I'm going by numbers mm-hmm. and by tape. Uh, there's lack of discipline with the corners forever with, with Corey Unlin. Remember, he was a, a holder from chip staff. Uh, he was there 15, 16, 17, 18, five years. Mm-hmm. Name one good corner they've had there other than Avanti <sighs> Maddox. Uh, yeah, Jalen Mills. Yeah, you know, Patrick I Robinson. Mean, that's it. <laughs> slot corner who they didn't draft, by the way. Right. Uh, if you let, Let's look at the corners. Okay, let's look at the corners since 2015, since Unlin was there. 
Eric Rowe didn't make it. Jim Schwartz didn't want him after year one. Uh, they got rid of him in, after uh, 16, did it? Was it after 16 or 15? Did they get right? Probably uh, 16. 16. First year? Yeah, 16, right. Uh, not, that's not a good sign. Ja'Cory Shepard never made it. Randall Evans never made it. Blake Kamos, they cut. Jalen Mills, now that guy made it. That was a great draft pick, seventh round or 16. Sidney Jones yeah. has been nothing but a disappointment. Russell Douglas has been a, has been a disappointment, nowhere near the level. Uh, Russell Douglas has been up and down, more down than up. Uh, Avanti Maddox has definitely worked. Uh, he's on his way to being a good football player. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned Patrick Robinson. Uh, Leotis McKelvin never made it the year, the, the one year he, he was hurt. DeAndre Hall, he boy, hurt. the kid they got from Chicago, he never even played. A Ronald Darby was a disappointment. There's no other way to sugarcoat it. He was a disappointment. He mm -hmm. never played anywhere close to the, to the level that they thought they were getting. Uh, I mentioned from my personnel source last uh, we put it on one of our shows in October that Darby's lack of eye discipline made him look slow because he was hesitating and he would get torched. Remember that Atlanta game? He was awful in mm -hmm. week two. Uh, they, the, the bottom line is Unlin did not develop the secondary as well as he should have. And, and here's another two more things before we move on here. The yardage given up to opposing receivers since he was there, bottom five in the National Football League. Awful. Okay. A level of big plays. That's that I don't have, but I have the, the – uh, I know for a fact against opposing receivers. Now, you could say, oh, well, yeah, well, how did they, were they better in the red zone? That's fine. They give up too many – they give up too many big plays. Way too many big plays. The lack of discipline, I, I just don't understand it. Uh, well, so. yeah, I, I have one wish for Marquand Manuel uh, and something that I hope that he, he puts into this – group of cornerbacks mainly that I didn't see from Corey Unlin. But before I tell you what that one wish is, Adam, I got to pause right now to tell you about our friends at PHL sports nation.com. Make sure you're checking out their work. They're always enhancing the fan experience with their coverage of the Eagles, the Phillies, the Flyers, the Sixers, everybody might be coming back soon. So that's good news. And they're going to have great content. Like they always do. They are for the fans by the fans. That's their motto. So make sure you're checking out, phl sportsnation.com and all their great content and we have a couple more sponsors that are gonna, gonna get a word in right now all right adam that was a nice little tease i had for what i really want to see out of marquan manual and his imprint his fingerprint on this cornerbacks crew right i think when you talked about the issues of n lack of development from the corners under Corey unland the one thing that always stood out to me is the inability of the corners of the Eagles the last few years to play the ball while it's in a turnaround. Oh, they don't get play the ball. Yes. Good point. It, it, that has got to be something that can be coached, taught, drilled, instilled. You know, we, we, you and I talk about like Juan Castillo with Trey Thomas in the yeah. video about how much of a stickler he was. I know that they have drills. I know that they work on these things, but when something is failing you time and time and time again, it's time to put more work into it. And I really hope if there's one thing I would like to see Marquand Manuel improve with these cornerbacks, it's how they play the ball when it is in the air. Now it's, it's look, it's going to be a challenge for this guy because outside of Slay, he's got a bunch of guys who are five foot eight and five foot nine. And it's not easy for them to do that, but it's fundamental, man. They've got to do a better job at that. Do you remember in 15, it was Chip Kelly's last year. What you just said was a big problem that year. Mm. Their their lack of technique. Uh, they they and another problem that they have, and I mm -hmm. forgot to mention this: the lack of turnovers. Man, they don't force turnovers. Yeah, it's hard get... to coach that, but I agree with you. It's it's something it's, that they have. But to you be know what? The, it, now, now now the the defenders of Corey Unlin and I. One guy specifically who I talked to said, he, he said he goes Philly. The one thing that they need to do is draft better players at corner. And I said, yeah, there's some truth to it. But they thought they did with Sidney Jones. Now mm -hmm. now now do we blame? We blame Onland for this, or is it a problem with Jones, or is it both? I don't know. I think it's fair to put it on both. You know, I think there's enough evidence of corners who are drafted high, like Sydney or Middle or Low, that didn't show you enough. And and the guys who we do talk about, as you mentioned, they didn't come from the Eagles. You know, Patrick Robinson played really well. He didn't. Come, he was drafted by a different, a totally different team. He was a veteran by the time he made it to the Eagles. And then we've had some veteran players who were good at times like Ronald Darby who came to the Eagles and seemed to either regress or not play as well as they should have. So I don't know what that entails. I don't know what that means. He's now the defensive coordinator in Detroit, right? With Matt Patricia. Yeah. 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 And one thing, yeah. you know, the, I don't know if this had anything to do with it, but I know there were some people who were concerned that Burke would leave with Unlin. 
to go to Detroit. So mm -hmm. maybe that's why they promoted Burke. But look, Corey Unlin is a sound coach. I've talked to guys who've played for him and guys who've worked with him, every, all like Corey. Mm -hmm. But the numbers are what they are. The, the tape that's is right. what it is. It's just not good enough. I, it, You know, you, you hate to point the finger because you don't they, – they, we, we, we outline they haven't been super talented at corner. And Russell mm -hmm. Douglas, who we mentioned in passing, he's a guy that's flashed but never consistent and he got benched. Mm -hmm. But you just if – you, if you take an overview – if we're being fair here, you go, where's the development other than other than really Mills and Maddox? Right. No, it's a fair question. I agree. By the way, what former Eagles cornerback, Adam, played in the same secondary as Marquand Manuel at Florida? Former Eagles safety? Former Eagles defensive back. Could be a cornerback, oh. could be a safety. He, was a, he played alongside Marquand Manuel at the University of Florida in the secondary. Uh, I'm just trying to fart, 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 fart. Um, give me the initial of the first name. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a giveaway. L. Alito uh, Shepard. Alito, that's yeah. right. Alito Shepard and Marquand Man. By the way, it is Lito. I only know that because Lito told me that. Uh, Lito is the best. I yeah, wish good, I could, nice guy. Yeah, nice guy. I that, wish everybody could just talk to Lito. He has unbelievable stories. <laughs> and, and I got to be honest with you. You mentioned Lito Shepard, obviously, and, and Sheldon Brown, who were terrific tandem. That's really mm -hmm. the last time they had a quality backfield and corner. Uh, uh, yeah, outside corner, no doubt. Uh, yeah, look, maybe it's a lack of talent. Maybe I'm, I'm being too hard on Unlin. But the fact of the matter is the numbers are what they are. The tape is what it is. It's never been good enough. I know mm -hmm. they won a Super Bowl. I get that. But uh, their offense, well, was, we, their offense yeah. is incredible. <laughs> can we admit, though, that it's also a little bit organizational? Like, this goes beyond Unlin. You just mentioned that Lito and uh, Sheldon, or, you know, the last really good cornerback tandem the Eagles have had. Well, that, that was over in, what, 2006 or seven. I mean, yeah. that, and then it was on to Namdi and DRC. And then there were so Jack, many guys drafted. Jack Ikeguanu. Jack Ikeguanu. Curtis Marsh. <laughs> Trevard Lindley. Um, who yeah. else is in there? I you mean, got them all, man. You, you, Eric you, Rowe. So, yeah. I mean, some of this has to fall on the front office as well. And by the way, they... Like, they never should have traded Eric Rowe. That was a mistake. I, I, I didn't I, like that. Schwartz either. didn't want him. Schwartz didn't want him. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, that, that one, and he's made himself into it. You know, he's a safety now, but he, you know, he, look, he played again. The funny thing is Eagles picked on him in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> they did. But, yeah. Although but, I gotta say, I mean, Alsha made it a tremendous catch did, over yeah. him. It wasn't yeah. like he burned him yeah. by, yeah. by yeah, 10 yeah. yards, but yeah. yeah. But um, the list goes, I mean, there are other corners that I'm just not thinking about. Now. But what do we just name? Like five or six corners that they drafted somewhere in the first, second, or third And they round paid for it. You, you, I remember you pointing this out. We discussed this last year, and you pointed it out. I think you must have had the list prepared. I you did. went over them in the last, like, ten years, and I'm like, wow, it's like a who's who of scrubs. They just yeah. never made it. Like, some guys are talented. Nike Guano, they never should have drafted. Oh, Another story from that. that we'll say that could be a whole show on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and by the way, Tim Halk. <laughs> Tim Houck remains as their safeties coach. Tim yeah. was the guy, folks, for the younger generation, guys in their 30s or 20s. Tim uh -huh. Houck was like, there was a time in Andy Reid early in the 2000s where it was like Dorsey Levens, mm -hmm. uh, Tim Houck, Jeff Thomason, all these ex-Packers or, or journeyman players that Andy had an affection for. They'd just come in and play because they needed somebody to fit. Chris Warren, I don't know if you remember, Chris Warren came in here. Although mm -hmm. he didn't play for Andy and he was there in Green Bay, but right. they would sign guys that literally like had like very little left. But mm -hmm. they, Tim Houck was that guy. He kept coming back. And uh, Tim's there. Look, the safeties have never been the problem. No. The, you know, they're the, they've been the, the, the performers, the smart guys and uh, the high character guys. There's a, they, uh, they've got so much mileage under Jim Schwartz. They've been so good at safety. I just don't get the, the cornerback stuff. And, you know, this year, Marquand Manuel, if, if he's going to come back in year two, uh -huh. corners got to play better man they don't they don't got to play like top 10 just, just play average foot can you play average football yeah that would be nice i feel like you were secretly asking for the list to be reprised here so i can give you it, it to you i can go. go through some great names please do go right. i love it 2005 yes. second round we've got i'm sorry fourth round sean considine he's a safety i guess safety, I yeah out of iowa yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he got about hurt this? yeah he got 2004 hurt. third round matt ware 
Safety played. He he got moved to safety. Remember he went to the He got Cardinals. moved to safety. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he played 95 games in his career, but he was, I mean, it was a third round pick. It didn't, and I, yeah. You know. He didn't, they got a little mileage, but not very much. Never either. started a game. So he was yeah. mainly a he special, a special teams, teams player. Yeah. That, that was, yeah. Nice. Yeah. 2006 fifth round Olympic skier Jeremy Bloom. Well, he was a Rob receiver, <laughs> but yeah, that was a mess. Yeah, but he played. he played both in college, right? He was a D back and a they wide draft receiver. him to return and be a slot right. receiver. He never made it. Yeah, right. Do you remember? Well, he's uh, CJ Gaddis, the hybrid defensive. You back. love Corner that guy. Safety, you love that round. guy. Well, you're CJ Gaddis so, and people... Rashard Barksdale. <laughs> Bar- yeah, well, yeah, he didn't make it. Who else? Oh man, we got uh, as we mentioned Jack Ikeguanu. Oh, was that was two thousand eight, or that was yeah, a fourth he, round pick too. Yeah, and they 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 uh, they drafted him knowing that he was coming back from torn ACL. That that was uh, that they admit, he never made it. Yeah. Right out of Wisconsin. Uh, let's see. Yeah, two thousand ten fourth round Trevard Lindley. That did not work out. He for had him. the high ankle sprain. Come out of Kentucky. He had ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, he another guy they missed on. Yeah, you're right. 2011, the follow the next year, third round again. That's a that's a that's an important pick. Uh-huh. Curtis Marsh. Mm, he did, zero did he, career starts. Did he? I was just gonna say he was a big time athlete, a former receiver, I think, at Utah. No, Utah? former running back. He running transferred back. from running yeah. back to uh, okay. cornerback at Utah okay. State. Utah, Utah State. State. Okay. Okay. I still remember Andy Reid. People love listening. People yeah. defending, kind of saying that the Curtis is a good pick because he played in the um at that point that was the Mountain West, I believe, for Utah State. He was, he, he, yeah, he was an and, athlete, but not a, oh, oh, because of right, that, they, that area. <laughs> And, and, you know, in the Mountain West, they throw them. All they do is throw the ball, you know, throw the ball all the time. So he had so many reps he, that he was going to come yeah. into the NFL and be prepared. Yeah, it was, bad. He, he, was an, he was an athlete, but not a player. Yep. Who else? Uh, the often forgotten. Now, this pick worked. I forgot it. I, I should give it this uh, okay. fourth round, 2012, Brandon Boykin. Now, he didn't have longevity, but he certainly played. Well oh, he years. was a great story. He was a slot corner for a bit. And then he got hurt. He kept getting hurt. Yep. Um. Brandon Boykin, and then Brandon Brand was in the uh, American Flag Football League with me. He was uh, yeah. Brand is a nice guy. It's a shame he really that was a good pick. That it is to he as you said he he didn't have the long lasting right. career, but he okay, was they a didn't good miss player. On that one. Yeah. Good slot injuries yeah. hurt him. Right, yeah. uh, two thousand and fourteen. I believe he was drafted first as a corner. And that's no one in thirteen, Watkins. huh? No one in thirteen. No, that was such a good draft too. Lane Johnson, oh, thirteen was, was Lane Johnson, Zach score. Ertz, Benny <laughs> might Logan, might be Hall of Famers. Yeah. Oh yeah. God, yeah, that was Benny good. Logan. Yeah. What? What? Fourteen was? Oh, it was uh, Jalen Watkins who? Right. I think they originally player. drafted him to play corner. Yeah, hybrid then, player. He came back yeah. later on. Uh, they missed him that one. They run up cutting him. Yeah, it was not not very good. Fifteen. And, and uh, I gave you fifteen. Eric was, Rowe, two thousand fifteen. Miss. Yeah. Shepard miss. miss. Evans miss. Yeah. Blake Countess miss Blake Evans Countess, hit uh, Mills right. home run. That was a great seven. That doesn't get better than that. They started. Yeah, it's just, funny because people don't understand. Right, people would say, "What are you talking about?" He's stinking. No, when you get a seventh round pick who can start for you and play productively, oh. that's a hit. Now it doesn't mean it's a very good corner. It just means right. that did the you value get value out of him. hitting on right. that seventh Correct. round pick? You yeah. nailed it. Absolutely. And then City Jones, unfortunately, to this point, has been a major mm-hmm. miss. Yeah, uh, he he's good. By the way. He could get a reprieve this year. He's going to have a chance to start. He needs to beat Maddox out. I doubt that he does it, but he's got right. a lot of ability. He needs to get out of his own way. Mm-hmm. Um, so Douglas, as I mentioned, and uh, Maddox is a player. Now, now the question with him is, before we get out of here, mm-hmm. Jeff, do you think he could work as a full-time starter on the outside? Maddox? Yep. Remains to be seen. I think he has. Give me an answer, buddy. Come on. Yes I think no, he has. Up, well, down. let's be fair. He's got. I think he's smart. I think he's got yeah. good instincts. I think he yeah. tackles well. I think he has all the attributes you want of a football player. The lack of height, yeah. height. Yeah, might hurt him. Now, maybe you can live with it. Maybe you can live with giving up a few long bombs or a few back shoulders against him because he's just not that tall because he's going to make plays 60 percent of the time that's what we need to find out i just haven't seen him play outside long enough but if you're if you put a gun to my head and said do you think this kid will succeed or fail on the outside i would lean towards succeed because he's a good football player here's the problem though okay if it doesn't work it's either city jones or probably trevor williams uh, I, yeah that's their I, problem I, not mine <laughs> yeah you know trevor williams has ability he's more of a fourth corner that's the way they say him yeah, we'll see if he can make it. But in Russell Douglas, you can't trust the guy. Right. He does it. He can't sustain anything. He he looked good for four weeks of OTAs. It looks like he's going to be a star. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's exaggerated. He looks like he's going to be a starting player for you. And then he regresses. He's mental errors, wrong because f- he doesn't run very well. He, he's handsy. Can get your hands on him. Right. Um, but he 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 when he's 
anticipating well. He plays well, and it doesn't work. So, look, they've got a lot of challenges here. It, it's all about their front. We just outlined, folks, uh, the Jim Schwartz and his coaches. And don't forget the, the list of that offensive show that we did. Love the comments for it. And also, go to our message board on Facebook. Sign up for it if you're not on there. Ask your questions. And Jeff and I pop in every week. We we'll yep. get into conversations. We answer questions. So get on there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. Once again, everybody, be safe, be smart uh, out there, and um, you know, let's all get through this together. Uh, big thanks to our our producer Hunter Brody. Check out his work, Sports Talk with Broads, on YouTube. Uh, check out his podcast that he does with former Villanova basketball star Daryl Reynolds. It's called Processed. Check him out on Twitter at Broads eighty one where you can get access to all his great work. And of course, thanks to our friends at 97.3 ESPN. Download their free mobile app and you can hear either Adam, myself, or Andrew DiCecco, uh on one day of, uh, during the week, Monday through Friday, as we do football at four uh, on 97.3 ESPN. And um, again, please go to the website, insidethebirds.com. We'll have a lot of fresh content for you coming this week. And we've got some great content on the site right now. As always, we thank you for flying with us inside the bird.